Hi there, everyone. My name is uh, Jim Jagelski. I want to thank you for attending the session today about my historical perspective over the ASF, a little bit of the history of the ASF, how we came to be, what we exist for, and things of that nature. And I figured, like Gandalf, who is also a gray beard, I think using my uh, Lord of the Rings pipe is most probably a good a uh, good addition to use as we go through these uh, the, these uh, tales of the past. Uh, a little bit about uh, myself. Um, I guess the biggest takeaway from this is that I am actually one of the co-founders uh, of the ASF. Been there basically from the beginning, so there is some uh, some good information uh, that uh, I can provide to everyone. Uh, and secondly, um, I'm lucky enough to, to work for Uber. So if you're looking for a, a job, I really encourage you to look at the uh, careers page with Uber. I'll leave the open source uh, program office uh, there. I wanna give everyone, before we actually jump into the history of the ASF, uh, talk a little bit about what the ASF is. Uh, it stands for the Apache Software Foundation. And before that, we were just a loose group of volunteers called the Apache Group. We were actually incorporated in 1999. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. There's actually a specific uh, tax criteria called a 501c3, which does need, mean a public a charity. We exist for our memberships and for the public itself. So we're not like a, a trade group example or anything like that. Uh, we are a virtual worldwide organization um, we do have an organizational structure uh, because obviously we need a formal legal entity to support the pure open source and volunteer aspects that we're running on. And this is the legal structure of it. We are run by a board and we'll actually talk a little bit about the board as we go through uh, the history of it. But the main takeaway again is that the board does not or should not interact or influence the direction of the projects. The projects run themselves. The board doesn't say, oh, you need to add this person. You need to add this functionality. That is really the project's desire. The board of the foundation exists as servants to the projects rather than the reverse. The ASF's mission is basically to provide software free to the, uh, to the public, free of charge under a very uh, permissive license, the license we use, the Apache license. Um, and it provides the opportunity and the legal protection for volunteers to do this kind of stuff. Now, as with most organizations, we've got this very verbose vision statement, but really it's really about community created code. Sometimes you actually see it referred to as community over code. The idea being that you focus on the community and if the community itself is viable and healthy, then the software project and the code that results from that software project will be just as healthy and viable as well. And we'll talk about why that's the case in just a little bit. Another thing to take away is that the ASF never pays for the development of projects. As I said before, it's really about the volunteers, the contributors, all volunteers, all contributors uh, have merit. Uh, so it doesn't just about, hey, you can be an ASF contributor or a member if you donate code, for example. You can do anything. As long as you contribute, you are worthwhile in the eyes of the ASF. So let's give a jump right into the history. Now, back in 1995 or so, there is this thing called the World Wide Web that was just becoming popular. A lot of people were using it. There was, of course, the old CERN web server that uh, Tim Berners-Lee uh, created. But the, really, the, the web server that took a lot of people by storm was one created by uh, NCSA. Uh, and the main person behind that was Rob McCool. Now, what happened is that when the people behind NCSA, you know, the people who were making the browser and Rob, who was doing the server, uh, left to create uh, Netscape, you know, uh, Mozilla, basically, this meant that this web server was stagnant. There was no one developing it. And we were lucky enough and fortunate enough to basically pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and create a, a fork of the NCSA web server, which we called uh, the Apache web server in honor of the, uh, the, the, the First Nation, uh, colloquially known as the, uh, the Apache tribe, the Apache nation. 
because we, I, we like the way that they governed themselves and the idea behind that. And so for several years, the Apache group was just focused on the web server itself. That's all we were concerned about, all we were concerned about. And it very, very quickly became the top web server in use throughout the entire web. Now, as it became more useful, as it became more popular, there were two things that were going on. First of all, there was the real desire of other entities to, to use this open source project. And yeah, it was under an open source license, but there was no legal entity called the Apache Group. Uh, and IBM in specific wanted to use the Apache web server inside their web sphere, uh, web offering inside there. And they were kind of hesitant about using something that was open source under an open source license, even there wasn't really something called open source back then, but the ideas were the exact same. What they really wanted to do was say, hey, you know, this is under open source, but there's actually this legal, legal entity which is releasing it under open source. Uh, that was one thing, is that we realized that we needed a legal entity to make it easier for people to use the software because that's, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted people to use the software with as few restrictions as possible. And that's the reason why the Apache license is permissive. The other thing is that we liked things such as having a roof over our heads. Um, and we realized that as Apache web server got more famous, more useful, um, it kind of like put us in a precarious position that people could sue us, even though it was released under something that said, hey, you had no warranties to it. And, you know, uh, we can't make any guarantees associated with it. Um, we also realized that the world being the world and some people being the kind of people they are, uh, they liked going after people and suing them for things if things didn't work out. So we wanted the legal protection for us to continue doing the fun stuff we were doing. And we also needed a legal entity to create uh, and release this software. And that was the impetus behind the Apache software foundation. We wanted to formalize this, but in a way that was as lightweight as possible. As I said before, the ASF exists basically because we want people, including ourselves, to continue doing the fun stuff of hacking away on code and releasing it. But we wanted the kind of uh, legal protection and the legal entity that also allowed other people to do that. So right before uh, we incorporated in 1999, there's an example of what the website looked like. And it really was just the Apache Web Server Project. If you went to www.apache.org, it was the Apache Group. And it wasn't until uh, you know, about June of 1999 that uh, the existing Apache Group members got together, uh, created the legal entity called the Apache Software Foundation, uh, formulated the bylaws associated with it, created a corporation under Delaware and applied for 501c3 status. And right there you see a copy of the incorporation agreement that actually bootstrapped and kickstarted the Apache Software Foundation in 1999. Now, unfortunately, the icon for some reason doesn't show up in there, but you'll see the website is very, very small. And we started off with basically two projects. Uh, the first, obviously, was the web server. That's basically the only software project we had at that time. But also, we had the idea of conferences. Now, back in 1999, there was uh, an ApacheCon conference, but it really wasn't put on by the Apache group. It was actually a, um, a conference put on by a company associated with the ASF. Uh, and there was, well, with Apache group. And a number of us were involved in presenting at it and things like that. But we realized that what we wanted to do is the ASF, or what would become the ASF, we wanted them to be the controllers of the Apache Con. So we started off with two projects, the web server and conferences. Um, and then we quickly added other things because at the time, open source was becoming much more popular. Uh, we had a great reputation in the web and the internet in the IT industry as far as being able to manage large projects. And so as Java 
became much more popular. And especially there was this desire to push the, uh, the Java servlet technology. Sun and, and other companies, but mostly Sun came to us and said, we would like to donate a lot of code to the ASF and we'll call it the Jakarta project. And this would be a place where we could focus on uh, Java code and especially the servlet technology. Uh, and also XML was becoming much more fashionable as a way of um, you know, passing data and information uh, back and forth. And IBM came to us and said, hey, you know, we've got all these great projects. We'd like to release these as, as open source as well. So you will see as very, very quickly, um, the ASF, in addition to uh, basically being leaders in the web idea with the web server, were also considered uh, stewards of other technology, Java and XML, which were critical in the acceptance of the internet, but also the web as well. We started off with just uh, basically 21 people. And one of the first things that we did was created uh, a second version of uh, ALV1, uh, ALV1.1, uh, which was basically a very, very similar to the BSD uh, uh, license as well. A very permissive license inside there. Really, really no difference behind it. But you can see that at this point in time, the reputation of Apache and the Apache Software Foundation was really starting to grow. Uh, it was in 2000 and 2001 that we actually had our first official ApacheCon that the ASF produced and managed that was down in Florida. We added uh, Apache Tickle, um, which and in addition to a number of other projects. And you'll notice that some of those projects were actually language-based. I mean, Java, of course, was language-based, but there was a growing uh, interest in um, not only the Tickle language, but how can we incorporate that with the web server? The same with Perl. Uh, and there was actually a period of time when PHP, the PHP group, was considered a sort of kind of Apache project, but more like a sister project. Uh, and for a period of time, if you went to the website, in fact, you can see it right here, that when you looked at projects under the ASF, PHP was there even though it wasn't really officially under the ASF corporate uh, umbrella. So, and we'll talk about that a little bit because that's a very, very interesting story. Uh, we started some initial work on the, uh, the second version of the Apache license back then. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, in the previous year, Jakarta grew up, you know, and Jakarta was really specified to be sort of like the repository for all things Java. In fact, everything that was under Java inside the ASF got moved into there. And what happened at this particular period of time is that as the Jakarta project started to grow, the number of projects under there also started to increase. The number of people inside there started to increase. But what we didn't realize at the time was that there was this growing disconnect between what I'll call the traditional Apache community and the Jakarta community. And so in some ways, even though it's under the ASF, it kind of starts deviating a little bit and starts becoming its own sort of entity, such that in 2002, the problem came to a head. It was really insurmountable. And what was the problem per se? The problem was basically that the projects under Jakarta and the contributors and the members of the Jakarta projects really did not know anything at all about Apache, did not know uh, any ideas or tenets about the Apache way, which is basically how you grow communities, how you manage uh, the open source projects under there. Uh, in fact, it was almost in many ways its own independent foundation within the ASF. And what we realized at that time was that even though up to that point, we've been able to assume that people could absorb the ideals and the tenets of the Apache way dressed through osmosis, that that tribal knowledge would be shared simply because we were all working on the same projects. Well, Jakarta was kind of like on its own different world and that tribal knowledge was not getting transformed over there. So the two things that happened because of that was because First of all, we realized that we needed some place, some method of ensuring that new projects that came on board 
understood what Apache was about and understood what the Apache way was about. And that's what the incubator did. The incubator is basically, and still is to this day, the place where projects learn, come to learn about the ASF um, and about the Apache way. And the other thing that we did is that we really encouraged Jakarta to become much more involved in Apache, making sure that these projects and these sub projects under Jakarta actually became Apache projects and really focused on ensuring that Jakarta moved under the ASF rather than under its own entity. Um, so in addition to the Jakarta sub projects becoming uh, ASF projects, other external projects came in as well. And then the other big thing that happened in 2002, which is an adventure that we'll talk about in a bit, is that uh, Apache joined the Java community uh, uh, process. Uh, and um, that was really the thing that gave Java and the Java community uh, a sort of important sense of support. Uh, it wasn't until the ASF joined it that I think that Java had the kind of, um, you know, worldwide or the potential for the kind of worldwide change agent that it became. It was really a feather in the Java community's hat to have Apache join. And it was really Apache saying, yeah, we believe in this technology. We believe in the community process designed to control and manage this process. Um, we trust it. And we think the rest of the world can trust it as well. And we'll see in a little bit what happened with that. Excuse me while I take a sip. Now, the next year, we started working on, as I said, we were also working on Apache License 2.0. But there were certain aspects of 2.0 that a lot of the projects wanted now, well, in 2002. And so we said, ah, well, what we'll do is maybe just take some bits and pieces of Apache 2.0, fold it into Apache 1.1, and we'll call that Apache 1.2. Uh, and that never really happened. We never really got to success uh, with that. Um, so it was basically dead on arrival. And the whole idea about what was going on with Apache was with uh, PHP was also coming to a head. It's like, it was kind of weird that we were like being so strict with Jakarta but PHP was even in a much more different shape than, than the ASF, than um, uh, Jakarta was. Uh, PHP was never under Apache infrastructure, although Jakarta was, um, you know, they weren't under the Apache license. And so it was weird that, you know, we were so forceful on what to do with Jakarta and we had PHP was sort of like the elephant in the room. It's like, what are we going to do with this? Another thing that we saw was that, uh, various projects such as XML and web services um, started becoming what we called umbrella PMCs, kind of similar to what was going on with Jakarta, where there was this large top level project and a whole bunch of smaller sub projects inside, which really should have been and could have been independent projects themselves. And that was something that was starting, starting to grow. And we were aware of it at the time really were concerned, uh, you know, uh, until things started you know, popping up later on. In 2004, uh, we actually did come up with the ALV2. And the main desire, of, well, one of the main desires of ALV2 was to be compliant and compatible with uh, the, uh, you know, the GNU, you know, public uh, library GPL um, V2. Um, and now during the discussion process and the drafting of it, we were assured that it was compliant, that it was compatible with it. And it wasn't until we released it that, that people said, oh, no, sorry, it's really not compatible with the uh, V2. Sorry about that. Um, so if you go to the ASF, we think it is compatible. If you go to the Free Software Foundation, they say it's not compatible. Just take that for what it's worth. Um, also during this time, um, we wanted to ensure that all the IP provenance of every piece of code that was under the ASF infrastructure, uh, we had uh, the ability to actually use it and relicensing it. And so we required everyone who had commit bits under CVS, we were still using CVS uh, as a version control system at the time, had signed a contributor license agreement, you know, basically making sure that at that point in time, every bit 
every byte of code that was contributed, we had direct IP provenance for. And so that was what I call the, the great signing, where we reached out to everyone who had ever made a, a commit um, and had them sign this form that we tucked away someplace so we could show clear IP provenance. We also created the individual uh, uh, CLA and the corporate CLA um, also to catch that base later on downstream. And what's really cool is that the ICLA is sort of like the standard that's used throughout the internet nowadays. In addition to the DCO, uh, Apache's ICLA, or the Apache CLA, some people don't use the I, is sort of like the default method used to ensure that there's IP providence. Um, also in 2004, we had what I call the second big painful lesson, the first one being Jakarta, uh, and that was a project called Avalon. Now, I included the link inside here because the discussion and the history behind it is really something that I could spend hours over. Um, and the slides are going to be available on SlideShare, so you'll be able to point and click and, and find those through and stuff like that. The main takeaway for Avalon was that it really showed that even though Apache projects are supposed to be very flat, um, everybody's vote is the same, no benevolent dictator for life, it shows you the problem that can happen when um, people inside of a project or an entity have a personal agenda and are able to push that personal agenda through either because uh, the PMC or the project or the entity um, don't want to be bothered with it or are willing to be steamrolled or, or whatever. Um, and what happened with Avalon is that we realized that the project itself was incredibly dysfunctional that it really wasn't operating as a community in such a way that it was harming itself, Apache's reputation, but also the projects and the entities which were other under Avalon. So we disbanded Avalon, we created um, top level projects to uh, replace Avalon. Um, and it really showed us that it was important, again, to focus on the health of a community and make sure that compromise and collaboration and consensus building were really top priorities. Um, and that was a painful lesson that we learned from, from Avalon. Um, and also at this point in time, we really decided that uh, an uh, you know, amicable divorce uh, with, uh, with PHP uh, made sense. Uh, and so we basically basically said, hey, you know, PHP was never really an ASF project and we're just making that official. And so we moved out of the way. And another thing that happened in 2004 is that we were actually, um, JBoss came after us. This was before, um, I think it was before they were bought by Red Hat, but they said that Geronimo project, which was operating in a very similar technology area, infringed on some of their copy uh, copyrights. Um, and what was interesting is that when you actually did the investigation, it was JBoss who had infringed on some Geronimo copyrights and some copyrights of other software projects inside of there. So they kind of got, got uh, bit uh, a little bit by that, but that was kind of interesting. Um, in 2005, the whole idea that Umbrella Project started losing favor. Uh, what we did not want to do is recreate the Jakarta fiasco with uh, some of the other uh, projects, top level projects, XML and stuff like that. And so we really encourage them to stop having sub projects and instead have these sub projects become top level projects. And I think one of the first ones to actually uh, you know, uh, leave these umbrella projects in Jakarta was Lucene. Um, Tomcat also became a top level project at that point. It was under the Jakarta umbrella at that period of time. Um, and we decided to take um, legal affairs even more seriously than we already had by creating a vice president associated with that. Uh, in 2006, um, was the Great Jakarta migration, where a lot, and I mean a lot of subprojects moved up to the top level status. Uh, we rebooted a couple of um, you know projects and committees. Uh, the security team, the public relations committee were also updated at this period of time. You know, Apache was, the Apache Software Foundation was incredibly popular, incredibly influential, um, incredibly relevant. Um, and so, 
uh, the idea of controlling our brand, of doing external marketing by promoting our projects, promoting the Apache way, promoting Apache cons, which is still running on. Uh, that was what the uh, PRC was designed to do. Uh, we also created a couple other projects. We actually hired a system administrator at this time. Up until then, um, all the infrastructure services, all the system administration done had been done by volunteers on their own time. Um, and in 2006, that kind of like became untenable. I mean, we wanted to ensure that there was, you know, as little downtime as possible. Um, and there's only so much you can do with volunteer services, volunteer help, volunteer contributors. And so again, abiding by the idea that, that ASF doesn't pay for development ever, um, it did make sense to hire assistant men such that if there was something wrong at 3 a.m. in the morning, we had somebody on staff, on call that could take care of it. Uh, we also started the ASF sponsorship program at this period of time. Uh, up until then, uh, really the only source of revenue for the ASF was, uh, was Apache Cons, uh, the uh, conference events and the, you know, the income um, from there. Uh, we decided that, hey, you know, we're going to be doing and growing a lot more. We need some way of companies donating to us, to us to uh, push down to the next level, to be able to upgrade our hardware, maybe hire more, hire more assistant bins, do more of the kind of work that we wanted to do to support our projects. Uh, and finally, in 2006, we completely shut down CVS with Subversion now as our main uh, source uh, uh, version control system. Uh, the year after that, there were a lot of projects coming on board. Uh, the website was getting quite stale, looking very, very old. Uh, and there was a big changeover within the board. It was the first time, at least in my opinion, that um, all the directors were what I call second generation. That is not, uh, not official uh, ASF founders. Um, I've been on the board, um, you know, from the very, very beginning up until last year or so. So I was a director for almost two decades. But this was the first time that except for myself, no one other else, no other director were a founder as well. And I found that kind of significant because it meant that we were doing pretty good in educating mentoring, stewarding, uh, the second generation uh, uh, of Apache people, of Apache believers inside there, so much so that they were elected uh, to the board. Uh, there was a major refresh to the site in, in 2008. Um, a lot of, um, you know, growth, uh, infrastructure was growing so much so that in addition to a sysadmin, we actually hired, didn't hire, we appointed uh, a vice president to actually control that uh, up until that time, the president that had been their major uh, uh, role was watching over infrastructure. Um, and also it was curious in 2008 that the ASF won, um, you know, the, the JCP uh, member of the year award for the third time, third time in a row. So the ASF had a huge, really, really good reputation inside uh, the JCP. I was a very valued member in the, in the JCP EC um, and people liked us inside there. So what was really weird is that we'll see a little bit how that kind of like came to hit us. Uh, and 2009 was a 10 year anniversary. Um, you know, our budget at the time was maybe about uh, $40,000, $400,000 a year, which included everything. Um, the number of projects, as you can see on the website, was huge. So the very fact that we were able to do all that with such a small amount of money was kind of, uh, kind of incredible. Um, and we did some uh, fine tuning inside the ASF to make sure that projects and committees were focused on the things we were talking about. 2010 was an incredibly um, important time in the ASF history. The uh, relationship between the ASF and, and the uh, JCP really came to a head, really soured. Um, one thing that happened was that IBM dropped Harmony. Uh, Harmony was designed basically to be a, a Java runtime environment, permissively licensed under the Apache license. Um, and IBM at, this period, at that time said, you know what? we're not gonna support Harmony. We think OpenJDK is the way to go. And all of the IBM employees 
who were paid to work on Harmony, if they still want to work on Harmony, it's fine, but we're not going to support it, which really was painful for Harmony. And we'll talk about that in a little bit in the lesson learned there. The other thing that really came to a head was that one of the conditions of us joining, us being the ASF joining the JCP, was that we would be able to release our source code, um, our projects under an open source license. Uh, one of the things that the open source definition requires is that there are no field of use restrictions associated with the code. You can't say, oh, you can use it here, but you can't use it here. The problem is that Oracle, and this is something they inherited from Sun, had a, um, a field of use uh, restriction on the TCK, which was the test kit. Basically, you couldn't use or you couldn't test your implementation on this TCK because you would bump into this field of use restriction, which meant you couldn't call it Java, which meant the use or the value of an Apache project in the Java community didn't make sense. You know, how can we release something as open source when we can't release it open source because it requires a field of use uh, restriction inside there? There was a lot of discussion, a lot of debate. We were really complaining about it a long time. We actually sent an open letter to, to Java and we said, this has to stop. This is not good. Um, we really didn't get a lot of support associated with that, obviously, because people, companies had requirements and restrictions on Java. We left the JCPEC. That was a big hoo-ha. Um, and one of the major things that uh, the, the ASF did to help prove again our insurance that community must come first. Uh, the Apache Harmony project was terminated uh, mostly again because the number of IBM employees were no longer uh, doing that, uh, were no longer paid to be able to do that, and they didn't have the time to code uh, code against it. And it showed again, I guess this is kind of like, you know, our third major hit, is that diversity inside of a project is vital, um, such that you can't have a project which is really, really heavily dependent on a single company supporting, because if that happens, if, if the company no longer you know, worries about that, then it'll affect the project. And so we hired that, we, we learned that as well. We hired our first and only executive assistant because again, the workload became too much and we were subpoenaed in the Oracle versus Google uh, thing. And in 2012, the uh, JCP office was finally dissolved inside the ASF. Uh, Apache 2.4 was uh, was released. The budget became about a three quarters of a million dollars, uh, you know. And then, um, in a way, to move the president position to more of a chief operating officer, we move some um, some offices, some roles, some tasks uh, designed that were ex you know executing operations. We move them under the president instead of being under the board. So basically, everything that concerned itself with executing operations were moved under the president. And I'll talk about why I was concerned later on downstream. In 2013, we grew like crazy. We held our 25th Apache Con. In 2014, we hit our two millionth code mark. When just a couple uh, years ago, we hit um, basically you know one, and our budget exceeds $1 million for almost the first time, you know, ever in the history. In 2015, we continued the growth plan. In 2016, we decided, you know what we're going to do? We are going to create a whole new branding for Apache. Uh, so we have new logos. Uh, the website got a major refresh, and we provided a lot more capabilities and functionality for people to be able to, you know, send that, uh, you know, use those, those logos as well. And we saw the growth of the third generation of ASF, uh, ASFers uh, inside there. In 2017, um, realizing that growth was a major uh, plan for us, we started figuring out what is our five-year plan? What should we go? Where should we go? How should we get there? Uh, created formal, really nice, slick annual reports that were designed not just for the IRS, but for everyone else, for the entire public out there. They're available under our, our public records. Um, and also in 2017, and this is more of a, 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 a personal note, we really started wondering what operations were, what roles actually execute operations. Uh, as I said before, a couple of years before that, it was kind of, kind of clear. If you had a role that required um, immediate decision-making uh, that were 100% operational, then obviously it made sense 
for those to be under the president. Um, but the couple of years or so around that, uh, we saw a lot other, uh, a lot more um, projects and roles and tasks go under the venue of the president. Um, some roles and tasks, which whether they were operational or not, were kind of like open to debate, open to discussion, open to consideration. Uh, in 2018, we had about uh, 200. Me? Yes. Um, I would just like to give you your 10 minute warning. Okay, perfect. Thank you. 10 minutes. Perfect. <laughs> In 2018, we hit about 200 million lines of code. Uh, we published uh, an annual uh, vision statement. We passed our first audit. Uh, an audit is, is something that goes through and makes sure your accounting uh, books are up to snuff and things like that. Um, and 2018, it's the first year uh, since the very beginning of the ASF that I decided you know what, I'm not going to accept the nomination to, to run for the board. I'm not going to accept the nomination to be, uh, you know, to, to run for, uh, run for as the director. Um, you know, it's time for me to let that go, uh, to ensure that the seat, which I had been basically sitting at all the time, was really open and available to, to, to other people uh, as well. Uh, in 2019, uh, there was a return of Jakarta, but not Jakarta as it had been known. It's basically the Jakarta Double uh, E project, which is under the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, they had been, you know, kind of ironic uh, alert is that it was really decided at this point in time that you know, what we need to really control and manage Java and the Java community is really an impartial. Um, foundation, um, kind of like what we were talking about and the SF was promoting for years and years and years, but it finally became fashionable to admit that. Uh, and that became, and that got moved over to the Eclipse Foundation, which was a wise move. The Eclipse Foundation was a uh, good choice for that. They wanted to figure out what kind of name to use. Jakarta was a great name. We had used it a while ago. They asked us if they could use it. We said, yeah, sure. And so that's the reason why uh, there is this entity, this project under Eclipse called Jakarta, which other than the name has no uh, association with Jakarta from the ASF. Uh, we also saw another project come back. Um, there was, uh, and this year, I guess the second major change in the board of director. Uh, uh, in general, every year or so, we'd have maybe two directors change. So we have a nine person uh, board. Um, and then, you know, every year we would reelect um, and renominate new people. And on average, you know, one, two, maybe three of those seats would change. Um, we had a large change in, in 2019 uh, because of a lot of different issues that have been very well publicized. Uh, two of the directors, including one who was the chairman of the board, decided to resign from the board, as well as the executive vice president resigned from the ASF and the replacements were, uh, were installed at that period of time. In 2020, we said goodbye to Apache Labs, which is basically a sandbox for people to talk about and play around with. We figured what with GitHub out there, there was really no reason to have um, you know, Apache infrastructure used for a sandbox environment. We had a release of our feature length film called Trillions and Trillions Served. Um, and it's available right from the ASF website. Uh, our next year's budget is close to $2 million. It's expected to be $1.7 million. And I think the biggest thing that I find extremely good uh, and extremely heartwarming about this year and the coming years is that I, I think it goes without stating that the relevance of the Apache Software Foundation in the open source community has kind of like waxed and waned and waxed and waned and waxed again somewhat over the years. And I think with this refocus on the value prop of what the ASF is, the refocus on project health with the eye towards the future, a refocus on the projects being the focus of the foundation rather than the foundation itself being the be all and end all. I think it really re-energizes the importance of the ASF within, uh, within the community. 
So the current status, and these are basically the slides I'll go through very, very quickly. Uh, this is basically, as he said before, you, uh, you can look and see how the change in the directors have happened. This green line right here is, uh, is me, as you can see from the very, very beginning. But you can also see the changeover. Uh, you know, we have a number of directors who are, you know, very, very new. In fact, in many ways, uh, you know, the current uh, board was uh, was a lot of people with no current board uh, experience. So that's a good thing. Um, it's good to have fresh eyes and fresh voices moving inside here. There is a lot of interconnections between the various Apache projects inside there. And this is a pretty nasty graphic that sh basically shows that, but it also shows the importance of community, of, of co-sharing uh, inside. We have a lot of top level projects. This is basically a graphic showing the logos of all of them uh, quite a long way from just maybe 20 years ago when we only had two. Uh, Podlings are uh, projects which are inside the Apache incubator with the hope to graduate to a top level project. And we also have a number of projects which have really done everything they retired, they needed to do, retired and went to what we call the Apache attic uh, as well. Um, most of our projects are in, in Java. There's really no rhyme or reason about that. But we also have uh, projects which are really under almost every language you could possibly think of. Uh, some slides here with a number of growth in projects and committers and things of that nature. Uh, we've grown like crazy. We will continue to grow and we will continue to promote the Apache way um, to the world at large. So I ask you as a main takeaway, please support the ASF. If you have any questions, um, follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is JimJag. DMs are always open. The slides will be available on SlideShare and there's a LinkedIn profile for me. Um, I think we've got maybe... Yeah, three minutes or so for, for q and I don't know if there are any uh, questions or answers. Well, I don't know if there's any answers because I don't know if there's any questions. But anyway, again, thank you for, for attending. It was a lot to, a lot to soak in. Um, I appreciate uh, everyone's attendance and I hope everyone really enjoys the rest of the day for ATL. I've been promoting ATL since the very, very beginning. I think it's a great conference. So um, if this is your first ATL, um, it won't be your last, I promise you. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to the moderator to see if there are any uh, questions that have popped up. Um, and let me, whoops, I, I think I saw something in Q&A uh, pop up. So let me put on my spec so I can see and see what that Q&A is. Uh, you said that you would not run for the board again in 2018. What led to your decision to step back at the time? Um, that's a great question. As I said before, Basically, every time I was nominated to be on the board, I was always elected. I was always handily elected, either like the first or second or maybe even the third person nominated in. So it was pretty much guaranteed that I would be a, have a spot on the board. And the way I was thinking about it is like, yeah, that's kind of selfish. It's kind of conceited. Um, you know, first of all, I didn't like being, you know, looked at as sort of like the official face and voice of the ASF. The ASF is not a benevolent dictator for life. Um, we don't like having those kind of people who are, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, uh, Apache. And it was really getting kind of like lumped in with that. And I wasn't comfortable with that. And that was one reason. And the other reason why is because by me constantly accepting the nomination, um, even though it was a nine member board and there were nine seats really available, uh, really, with me, uh, it was always going to be eight seats available. I didn't feel right about that. So in 2018, I said, you know what? It's time for me to just step away. I can be much more useful as a member, you know, and speaking as a member rather than having that director hat always associated with what I was talking about. So great question. Uh, uh, thank you for, for asking it. Um, any, well, it's time. It's a, a, a quarter past the hour. Uh, thank you again for attending again. Um, feel free to contact me. It's free, free to connect either by LinkedIn and Twitter. Have a great day. Cheers all. Thank you again.